everybody. I, I visited a church one time on a Sunday morning, and they had intermission. Like, after they'd have worship, they would have intermission. They had, like, popcorn and snacks and coffee in the back. And, like, church would take a break for, like, 15 minutes. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have brought that up. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's good if the Holy Spirit's not moving in your service to have an intermission, I guess, because it keeps people refreshed and engaged. But otherwise, I don't know. I don't know. Praise the Lord. So um, when I was asked to speak this morning, I was very excited because this is, I'm going to share with you guys um, really from my heart what the Lord's been doing in the last, well, 10 years maybe. Uh, and it was about, um, about being a true friend. But we're going to look at Jesus because he is the greatest friend. And so I'm going to pull out some points, um, and they're organized, so for those of you who take notes, you'll really enjoy that. <laughs> and Pastor Skip, I love that you are reading the Word uh, during your teaching, because that's a lot of what I'm doing today as well. So we're just going to jump in uh, about being a true friend. I'm just going to start with prayer. Thank you, Father, for your presence here this morning. Thank you, Father, for grace to be on my lips, Lord, that I would be able to speak your word and that the, our ears would all be open, Father, that our spirits would be able to receive from your spirit, God. We say, Lord, have your way in our midst. Change our hearts, change our minds. Renew us, restore us. Shape us the way you would have us to be. And Father, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would be tangible here this morning, that your presence would be tangible, that we would have an encounter and a connection with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm so excited to share about Jesus. I get That's probably the thing I like most about Michael Koulianos' teaching, is he just talks about Jesus. And even if you've heard it, a bunch of times before, a lot of the stories, it's Jesus, so it's, it's just so cool. Um, I walked into the office the other day, my grandfather was going through slides in his little projector machine, and he had all these pictures of Israel from when they visited Israel when my dad was a kid. And it made me want to go to Israel. And he's like, this is where Jesus this, and this is where Jesus that. And I know there's a lot of like um, religious things that can be attached to a, to a lot of that stuff, right? But also when you love somebody, knowing this is where they walked, and this is where they were born, and this is where it's special. You know, when I went to Ethiopia, I wanted to go see out in the country where Petros was born. Um, I wanted to go see where he was raised. I wanted to see the apartment that he lived at. Because I love him and I'm like, there's sentiment to and value to things and places where he's been. And that was, that was really cool. Okay, bunny trail. So I, as I was praying, the Lord was just showing me, firstly, um, it's going to be a little prophetic, but first of all, the Lord was showing me, Sarah, who do you desire? He was asking me questions. What do you, who do you want? Who do you want to be with? And I said, Lord, you are my portion. You are enough for me. And the Lord just began speaking this truth, which is so interesting that Heather sang that out this morning as well, um, about the Lord being our friend, that this is not just poetry. He either is or he's not enough. And um, Jesus is the greatest friend that we can have. So we're going to look at Jesus, and I'm going to break down just some, some ways that Jesus was a friend and ways that we can imitate him. And these are in no order of, like, importance or, like, they just get better. But uh, number one is Jesus gave invitations. He extended himself. Jesus never chased people, but he made opportunities. He gave invitations. Immediately, I think of him going to 
um, the brothers by the boat, James and John, and they're fishing, and he's like, hey, come with me. He always extended an invitation for people to follow him. He didn't demand anything. He didn't follow people around, but he made himself available. He created an opportunity for somebody to choose to say yes or to ignore. Another one I think of is when Zacchaeus, the wee little man, was up in the tree, right? Jesus saw him, he walked over to him, and he made an opportunity. I'm going to come to your house for lunch. So there's a moment where he's providing an opportunity for connection. Number two, Jesus spoke truth. As a friend, there is nothing more powerful than speaking truth over someone that you have influence in your life. I actually put a slash here and I wrote to prophesy. It's so important in our relationships that we don't just comfort someone with something that something they would want to hear or something that pleases them, but that we speak truth to the situation. Uh, whatever is going to solve their problem is not just what's going to make them feel better. A lot of times, speaking truth can be uncomfortable to a person. <laughs> Faithful are the wounds of a friend, it says in Proverbs. Being willing to speak truth. Um, number three, have no expectation. When Jesus would extend himself or he would do something, there wasn't an expectation attached to it. Like, if you did this, you'd love me. If you came with me, if you listened, he... He always was just extending himself, and it really is the picture of love, Jesus on the cross, completely vulnerable, right? His arms out, completely exposed, but doing it for us. And there was nothing attached to it, whether the people rejected him, mocked him, even caused him pain, hurt him, he was still going to be there. He, in all of his power, could absolutely have taken himself off the cross. He could have done anything he wanted to, but that's the picture of Jesus extending himself and not being reliant on the person's response to his, to his love. How often do we extend ourselves and attach an expectation to it? And then if, it, if that expectation is not met, we retract Jesus stayed. He just stayed. They continued to mock, and he just stayed. He didn't change his mind. Uh, number four, well, this really connects with that, is he loved. He offered himself to love and to offer yourself. Um, Romans 5.8 says, While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. There was nothing that Jesus did on the cross that was selfish. There was nothing about his walk that was self-fulfilling or self-pleasing. All of it was sacrificial. All of it was one person giving it. You know, we all say phrases like, it's a two-way street, or when talking about relationships, but Jesus is the picture of Father, right? And his the picture of Jesus is one person doing all of it and receiving the other. Uh, number six. Did I say number five already? I'm sorry. Number five, to forgive. He so quickly would forgive. He so quickly would like, I love that scripture, Romans 5, 8, with this point as well, because it was while we were still sinners that he died. It was while we were still causing problems and not receiving him and not believing in him that he chose to give himself. There was nothing attached to it. There was no, he, he knew, because he knows the future and he's a prophet, right? He knew that people would receive him eventually. He knew that for the prize set before him, he endured the cross. But he put himself out there no matter what, and he did it first. So it's like you know someone's going to hurt you, you forgive them before they already hurt you. Like, it's hard for us to forgive after. He forgave before. 
Imagine the pain of anticipation, <laughs> knowing somebody's going to hurt you, knowing they're gonna, he's going to slam my hand in the door on purpose, but I'm going to forgive him. You know, if you just think about something practical that probably would never happen, we'll say your brother is going to slam your fingers in the door. You know it's going to happen. He's going to do it, but you love him and you forgive him anyways, knowing he's going to do it in the future. That's just so backwards. Usually you have to Go through the healing. You got to whine about the bruise. You got to point it out to a few people first. You got to experience your pain. Then you come to like a resolution of, I can let this go. I can let the hurt go. He anticipated the hurt and he already let it go. That is just like inside out to me. My mind is like, whew. Number six is our camping ground this morning. Jesus was compassionate. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I, a perplexing story, yet beautiful, um, is when Lazarus died, Jesus wept with Mary. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead, but he felt compassion on her. He felt her pain. He cried with her. Uh, we're going to turn to Matthew 14. And we're going to start in verse 13. This is another example of Jesus' compassion. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Now, when Jesus heard it, previously what happened before here is his cousin was beheaded. His cousin was killed. So Jesus heard about it, and he departed from there by a boat to a deserted place by himself. So he had just heard about somebody that he loved, Somebody he worked in ministry with, his cousin who baptized him, had just lost his life. And he went to go be by himself. But when a bunch of people heard it, they followed him. <laughs> I don't want to be followed if I go somewhere on purpose to be by myself, especially in grief. <laughs> like That's the last thing somebody wants, right? Like a herd of people following you. When Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, yet he was moved with compassion for them. In the midst of his own pain, in the midst of his own sorrow, he looked out at these people and he was moved with compassion. I love the word compassion because it shows, it's, it is like moved with compassion. That was always Jesus, right? He was never moved with pity. He was moved with compassion. He saw people where they were, and he had love within him that compelled him to help them, that wanted to fix, that wanted to heal, that wanted to make whole, that wanted to make new. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fishes. He said, we'll bring them here to me. He even wanted to take care of them, make sure they were fed. Like, he just, he's such a daddy. <laughs> he's going to take care of them. Matthew nine thirty six. Thank you for your word, Lord. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. The whole point of being a friend is not what someone can do for you or how they can meet your needs, but it's how you can be a channel of the Lord's love to another person and meet their needs how you can extend yourself, offer yourself, and show a picture of what God is to them, regardless of their response, and have no expectation on them. That's the hardest part, is the no expectation. Uh, 
Your friendships are not about you, fulfilling your own needs, but rather meeting another needs, meeting another's needs, and showing love. 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He is the source, and we have to, um, we have to be under this faucet. We have to be under this bucket of outpouring. We have to be able to receive from him. There is nothing that we can give in our own willpower that will last We can offer ourselves up to an extent, but unless we are full of the Holy Spirit, it has to come from an overflow, or we burn out. We get hurt, uh, and we burn out. So thinking of relationships, particularly friendships, we have to have this place fulfilled with the Lord. And the Lord has taken people in and out of my life to bless me for a season, but then to cause me to lean on him and to see him as my friend. And the temptation, which Miss Lois and I were texting about, the temptation is to feel alone and feel like you don't have a friend. And the Lord has really been convicting me um, in the same way that we were discussing that he is our friend. And when we have this need that we place on other people to fulfill us, to comfort us, to be there for us, it's going to be impossible. And there's an attention sometimes that that you want or, you know, something will happen and you don't feel like you have that person that you can call and talk to about it like, like you want to. Or you feel... You just feel lonely. Has anyone ever felt lonely and just wanted a friend? (laughs) There is a friend who is greater than any other friend, and we cannot ignore him and his presence. We cannot set him aside and say, it's not enough. I need a person. Jesus is like, I am a person. I took on flesh for you. I'm not there anymore, but I gave you the Holy Spirit who's now with you and is your friend. He's your comforter. He's your teacher. He's your constant companion with you always. And I've just been in my own heart, like feeling like a rebuke from my own spirit almost, being like, who are you to disown the best friend that he gave me? Like, in this way, we reject the Lord. In this way, we say, he's not enough. Lord, you are my portion. You are enough for me. I mean, there's so many songs that we sing. Literally this morning, Jesus, you are enough for me. Um, But it can't just be a song. It can't just be poetry for us. Do we actually believe that? Or do we still think we have to have another person to be able to speak to us, to hug us, to comfort us, to call us, to check on us, to go with us to do things? Or do you really believe you can have a connection with the Holy Spirit where he fulfills all of those needs? He fulfills all of those needs. If we receive from Father like Jesus did, then we can give like Jesus did. Philippians 2, 1 through 3. It's a challenge. It's a challenge on us to see what we really believe and what we're committed to. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not for his own interests, but for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He emptied himself. Oh, we're going to go to John 15. Thank you, Jesus. John 15, verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one, one's life for his friends. Uh, I heard somebody make this connection before, and it's so beautiful. This is, this is just before Jesus was taken, just before he goes into the garden, and Judas meets him there with the guards. Jesus says, a greater love has no man than this, than a man who lays down his life for his friends. And then his very next phrase, you are my friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice for us. John 16, 32. Just moving over one chapter here. <laughs> Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <laughs> Going back to John 15 here, what is it that makes our joy full? These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. I'm in verse 11 now. That your joy may be made full. If you abide in my love just as I have abided. And then to love to love each other that way. <laughs> I'm going to read it again. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Now this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's why looking at the picture of Jesus and how he loved and how he was a friend is so important. It's going to make your joy full. This is what's going to fulfill you. Not only make your joy full for a moment, that your joy may remain. That my joy, capital my, capital M, not a capital Y, my joy would remain in you. I want the joy of the Lord to remain in me. Love one another as I have loved you. And lay down your lives for each other. So I feel like there's just a call this morning to, uh, to believe. It's so cool how the Holy Spirit just weaves this like intricate tapestry. I wanted to say web, <laughs> but we'll say tapestry because there are many people here who probably don't love spiders. Um, 
but Miss Lois, she would love the spider, right? You would save George, you just put him outside. No need to squish him. <laughs> uh, when we lived, when my parents were building a house, the Neveras graciously took my family in and um, we lived with them for, I don't know how many months, four months, five months? A good bit. We had sold our house and we're finishing the new house and in the little bathroom we had down, we had a bathroom all to ourselves, which was wonderful. Um, there was George, I had named him. He was a daddy long leg that probably had lived down there. I don't know how long they live, but I'm just pretending that he had been there for a long time. And uh, someone, one of my friends was over spending the night and she was like freaking out and screaming in the shower. And I was like, just tell me it didn't hurt George. <laughs> Making this big joke about the spider. So I always call daddy long legs, George. Although Petros, I also call daddy long leg because the man has really long legs and he's a daddy. Uh, that was a bunny trail, sorry. <laughs> So anyways, I feel like the Lord is calling us to this place of believing that he is our friend, that the first step of this is really, he wanted to introduce that idea of him wanting to be our friend, that for it not to be this outside distant thing, like, oh, I know God is there for me, but I really need a person right now. Now, he gives us people, right? And he does move through people to show his love and his comfort, but there's a reliance that we need on his spirit and a transfer of our expectation from people to meet our needs to letting the Lord meet our needs. And this closeness that we have to develop with the Lord where I feel bad because sometimes I would be upset that I didn't have someone to talk to and I'd pray and I'd even be saying things as I'm praying like, I have nobody else to talk to, <laughs> saying to God. And I praise the Lord, he is not easily offended right? When you come to someone, if you call them and you say, I just had nobody else to talk to, you're like, what am I? Chopped liver? Like, come on, I'm here right now. And that's what the Lord's saying. I believe there's an invitation and an extension to us as his friends this morning, that we need to be able to connect with him in that way. And he's going to make us into wonderful friends for one another. But we have to be first fulfilled in letting him be our friend. So I would like to have just, I'm going to make an invitation for those of you who would like to come forward and, and to pray for you that the Lord would, there's almost like a reshaping that needs to happen in our minds and in our hearts where the Lord changes and just renews and restores our expectation and we transfer onto him. But there also has to be a commitment with this where we spend time with the Lord and we develop that closeness and we relate to him as a friend. He's God and he's sovereign and he's holy, but he's very present and he cares about us. He has compassion toward us. In any of our pain and our weakness, Jesus would weep with you. He would hold you, he'd weep with you. But finding that place in a, in a prayer closet, finding that place where you're alone with Jesus and he fulfills you, and out of that overflow where you're able to give out, you're able to extend yourself and be a friend just to meet someone's needs where you walk in on a Sunday morning and you're not worried about who says hi to you because you're so busy trying to make sure that everyone there has gotten attention from, from you instead of toward you, where you want to check on people, you want to pray for people, you want to take care of people, you want to love on people. It just it changes the whole perspective of our need I mean, uh, I love the way Papa Tony talks about he can see in a wife the way she's fulfilled and the way she radiates, you know, like um, he said he went to a meeting and this, this wife, this woman was, she didn't look well, like she seemed really down and kind of dark and he immediately went over to the husband and said, what's going on? Like he wanted to talk to the husband and how he was, because a woman radiates, right? the love from her husband, it really shows in a relationship when you're fulfilled. So just an example of how when we're fulfilled by the Lord, there's this radiance about us and our joy is full. So praise the Lord. He wants to fill us. So 
Heather, would you play and sing? Okay. I would like for us just to take a few moments at first. If this is hitting you with any sort of conviction, just to find a place before the Lord, to talk to him, to repent, to, to make yourself vulnerable before him and ask him to show you if this is you in any place, if, if you've done this with the Lord, if you've taken his Holy Spirit for granted. Um, and then as you're ready, you can come to the front and we'll pray with you and just ask the Lord for this miraculous change to take place in your heart, for him to set things straight in your, in your mind, in your expectation, in your spirit, and just agree with you. You guys are going to be great friends. <laughs> Praise Jesus. <laughs>